I have up uh, in uh, the homunculus spot here the um, oh, some fun main, <laughs> hey. right the main uh, principles of alchemy. There's the three principles: sulfur, salt, and mercury. And I've labeled sulfur yellow, mercury red, and that is the positive and negative, the anode and cathode charges going into the electrolysis reaction, your salt. And in the salt jar, uh, there's always this line in the middle, this exclusion zone that forms between the two. Right. Wow. Interesting. So uh, I'll get back into that. All, all, uh, all three of them. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah. Oh, can... let me go ahead and flip that. Get, get there we go. In the right so mode. These are... Okay. So this is what I showed the other day. I only showed this interaction and, and uh, it's this one up here. So here we're looking at the, that at the side view of two different wires that are crossing at a 45 degree angle, as we're seeing from the, uh, from the top down here. So we're just looking at sort of the, you know, the end post of these two individual conductors. These could be copper, carbon nanotubes. They could sure. be a variety of different conductors as long as they can carry the transitive electrons. And so there's a, there's a possibility of interaction between two different wires carrying an electron on the outer edge as in the evanescent field. So we have two, you know, we, well, actually we have three different types of electron states that can flow through a wire. The first state that we have is what we would call a conduction electron. This is not necessarily a free electron, but it's simply the transfer between a perfect balance of electrons and protons inside the atoms of the conductors, where we get jumps from one conductor to the next. And these conduction electrons, they can't do this shape. We have a second type of uh, electron in these conductors called a free electron, which can make this shape, but they won't make it unless they're at the outside edge of the conductor. And in the third state, these free electrons, if they are riding in the evanescent wave on the outside, they get to do something that other electrons can't do inside the conductors. Hence why I say this does not happen every single time. This is a rare interaction, but it can be caused to happen if we coordinate the exact interaction angles. So the reason for why is if we take an electron, this circle in the center, and we yeah. accelerate it along this vector here, we're going to get something called a geometrically amplified relativistic field, which means that these jumps. these little red arrows here, um, these are the relativistic field that we'll detect from the electric potential of the electron as it's moving along this vector arrow, and we're viewing it from either this position or this position. Now, if there's an acceleration, we have a slightly larger electric field in the direction of acceleration versus the direction behind it. But what's really important here is from the side, we can see that the blue arrows are the normal electric field of a stationary electron, but the red ones are what happens when it's moving. And we can see that it appears the electron is uh, a greater strength as viewed from the side in this position if it's moving past that point here. And because of these electric fields, it ends up doing something super weird. So let's go back to our first example here. The other day I showed that there was a double omega and, uh, oh, did I freeze? I guess not. Okay. So the other day I showed that there was a double omega, and I said that in this in this case, we get an omega on the top, this shape here, and an omega on the bottom if one was moving away from us and the other was moving towards us. Well, mm -hmm. it turns out that actually, in that case, they would have to both be moving away from us to make the omega symbol on both sides. But this is where I was wrong. If one is moving away from us, like on here, the top side, this this red line, this trace represents the electron moving away from us. Right where at the cross point there, where the two wires cross, if the electron is exa exactly at the bottom side of the wire, it will be repelled away from the extra electric field, that one right there, because the interaction is orthogonal to the direction of motion. And that extra repulsion can cause it to actually take a loop either through the conductor in a very small fashion just right at the surface to penetrate the depth and go inside or to actually take a loop all the way around the outside that so just happens inside of carbon nanotubes and on the other side we can see that the cross section as we look at it from our angle produces the alpha if we look at the cross point between both sides at 45 degrees up and 45 degrees to the side we see a double infinity and if we look directly from the top down we see the swastika these are the natural symbols of a double sine wave cross path length that these two particles make when they're starting in the evanescent field. And because of that, we get an unusual interaction. Now, this interaction should allow superconductivity because these will have to accelerate and go almost superluminal 
In fact, I, I believe that they do go super luminal. Does uh, does the blue in that example go behind the tube? Yeah, I see that. Okay. It does. Yeah, so you can see you can see how the repulsion due to the extra relativistic electric field can wow. cause these types of <laughs> oh geometries God. in these shapes. So which frequency is this that you're putting in to get these three DC like, DC yeah, and you're right getting right. alpha yeah. omega the swastika yeah. Yeah. and the ohm out of this Go the go field. back and show that again. You you you're you're yeah. on to something. Amazing. Okay okay okay. Uh, please, please now go ahead on. and tell me what you want me to see or what you want to see and what you want me to show because I had a, I have no problem going into this even deeper. Back back, back out know. a bit yeah. So we see the full. Spectrum. Oh the full the full. There the, we go. Yeah, there so, it is. Bingo. So the alpha okay, so, the omega. So you got the double tubular and if the alpha omega are going through these tubes they're going to create. A similar resonance to these two ultra shapes that we see uh, above above the bottom two shapes. So we got these ultra shapes, which are top top down and and three dimensional. And so the alpha omega will create that within the tubular space as a resonance throughout it throughout its existence. That's that's sorry, fucking it's wild, anyway. right? And Seriously, that's is, fucking brilliant. Oh, my game. God. Oh, and that's <laughs> right? one more symbol I need to show, too, and this is important, too. I mentioned that I had found the epsilon as well, and here it is. So yeah, no. in, you, in, in a conduction between two, and this would only happen in carbon, this would happen in carbon nanotubes predominantly, which, by the way, you could make carbon nanotubes, as the Egyptians did, by burning hemp. And the hemp rope will produce a natural striation of carbon nanotubes. Well, if you have them cross it, it on the bottom, and it burns, you get an yeah, electron exactly. jump between yeah, yeah. One the next on the outside, and they will make this little shape, this little double, this little double loop de loop. In jumping from one orthogonal conductor to the other, they can't just take this straight path like this little ninety degrees bend. They actually have to take this double loop in order for the magnetic field and the spin alignment for both particles to come out at the end. And the funny thing is, when they do come out at the end, in this case. In two carbon nanotubes. Well, I like how you have those going crosswise. Yeah. That's right. They come out crosswise better, better and, shape, and yeah. their dipole moments are exactly reversed. So these yep. will form a Cooper pair and act super wow. conductively coming off the carbon. Wow. Hence exactly why we found that if we cross two carbon or graphene sheets at an exact angle, that we get super conductive like properties that were found and not quite understood because the geometry was not yet known. But you could think about the electron running on, run along basically a, uh, you know, a string like a bead with a hole through it, and they're going to want to stay along this certain alignment path. Well, it's the fields that control exactly where they go. Right. So Dalza pointed out, yes, this is very much like Walter Russell's diagrams. He's seen this too, and he's seen the interaction. Russell was, was a genius. Absolutely, he has some of the best elemental diagrams and the breakdowns in terms of how they interact that I've ever seen. And I love the fractal nature of what he's discovered. So I, I would say that this is a discovery has been known about by the ancients forever. And that's why we've seen these symbols. They may not but, have. But, but, but these, these two points we right do. here, where you have the, the top down view, but then the three dimensional side view, I think that's super key because it shows how it overlaps and it folds within itself. And that that's, wow. Yeah, seriously. Dude. The part that blew my mind is it's the exact same motion. It's the exact same motion that nothing changes between any of those different diagrams. It's just that we're looking at it from a different angle. That's all that changes. It's just how we look at it, right? What where we're facing. So it's the frame of reference, the observer and their position in relation to this cross field interaction is what determines the geometry that we see come out of it. My mind is still melting from it. Right, like just from a different, <laughs> from a different angle, different perspective. That uh, from multiple perspectives, multiple angles, you're getting multiple sacred geometric symbols and geometries. It truly is mind blowing. Thank you for that. I mean, that was like seriously. Thank you for yeah. hearing me. I am yeah, yeah. glad that somebody wow. gives a crap about this crazy discovery. <laughs> We all do. It's fascinating. It connects into this theory of everything, right? That so many of us, like in the physics, and connecting essentially the cross between metaphysical and physical, and what the ancients knew, and the real uh, knowledge of the mystery schools, such as these Platonic solids, the uh, harmonic octaves of the spheres, and 
um, like the super advanced mathematics, geometric, dimensional knowledge and language that the ancients knew that uh, we're only starting to understand and have come out publicly. But for instance, the twister, the uh, Masonic initiation of the third degree of the twister uh, that you know was in the APEC uh, presentation last month. It just from every angle, it's fascinating stuff, and it just it's accelerating. I'm unfamiliar with the twister. Sorry. I do love the word that it's accelerating. That's a great that's <laughs> use of the word in both the figurative and the literal sense. Oh, shit. Right, the, propulsion. No time, long time no see, man. Oh, what's good, guys? Uh, sorry. Welcome, guys. Guy coming to hop in. What's up? Yo, who's <laughs> Gun Woo? Haven't seen you in a while, man. How right? Feeling. Oh, welcome to the fold. <laughs> yeah, so what's this right. about? The fold is a great term for what we're dealing with. The fold it's a fold or it's like a shard, it's a fractal within this higher dimension uh of reality of the universe of this metaverse, and that it's connecting <laughs> all of them, and that like uh Jeremiah's demonstrated here, the alpha, the omega, and the uh, swastika all within DC current. Now, I do want to point out too, and this may be important for experimenters to know that the likelihood that this event will happen in terms of the evanescent wave interaction becomes more and more likely as the impulse speed or the rate change of the current flow um, rises. And so if you give this Tesla impulses between two cross conductors compared to your, your continuous steady state DC, the likelihood will go up by orders of magnitude that this effect happens. Because when you have a fast impulse traveling down a conductor of any material, um, it's more likely that the electrons will travel around the outside of the wire instead of moving through it, since that's the most efficient way that they can travel due to the fact that they're repelled from each other and following that geometric field amplification due to relativity. So you're, you're kind of describing the sun. So what, what's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, back EMF is a great way to do it. Bedini knew that. Um, you've got a bunch of people that, that have played around with the back EMF. I mean, it's kind of like the thing that all the free energy guys have talked about for all these years is you have to use this extremely fast impulse because when you do and you have the right field interactions, you get the emergence of this other phenomena that doesn't otherwise take place for the most part. Yep. And they were saying that that it would create, you know, the possibility of the conductor actually being warm, but yet when you tried to feel close to it, it would be cold and it would be pulling in uh, temperature from the surrounding ambient. That this is where you gain huge extra voltages, where with only a three volt input, you may get as much as a 20,000 volt uh, back EMF impulse out of the same winding with only 20 turns. And so we've seen all these kinds of effects before. And they happen the faster that you, your impulse speed is, the faster that rise time and that fall time is, this is where the stuff seems to emerge out of. And I think it's, it's just because you have this relativistic kind of interaction. Are we talking about the Phoenix event? About the what? The Phoenix event? <laughs> or no. What's that? Free, no, free. solar output. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Leave I mean, it's... It. The Phoenix event is somewhere somewhere along the lines. I mean, it's still uh, a coronal discharge. Sure. Yep, coronal discharge. Yep. Yeah. Bring it back into the alchemy, and like you're saying, Hans, that describes the sun. And uh, I was mentioning earlier in um, Zertus's first stream about my alchemy experiments when making monoatomic gold, and how the alchemists put gold to the sun and uh, I noticed it would make this regular uh, white monoatomic gold or gold colored uh, nano gold during the day while the sun is out. And then as soon as the sun set, it would start making this black nano material instead. Uh, and that uh, I <laughs> figured that out and to test that after first noticing when I was making monoatomic silver uh, and how it correlated to the cycle of the moon and uh, uh, after testing it several countless times now that basically when the sun or the moon is uh, full, it will produce a bunch of monoatomic silver. When the moon is uh, empty, it won't produce any. And uh, uh, 
-hmm. even to the point of a full moon right before an eclipse it produces a whole bunch of it and then as the eclipse happens it stops making uh, any at all in the reaction until uh, the eclipse uh, ends and it goes back to producing a whole ton of it it's pretty crazy so i can talk about the five phases of the sun but wow you've just described five phases of the moon which is very interesting um wow wow so um i've been to egypt twice and i've learned a lot about chemitology and so the chemit scenario is very different from egyptology egyptology came out of greece uh the Greeks understood so much of the hieroglyphs, but they didn't. Uh, right. It's an appropriation of, you know, uh, yeah, of Egypt. Oh, big time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a usurping of, of knowledge. Um, the word Egypt comes from ho kepta, which was a Greek word that meant the land of Ptah, which Ptah was an ancient Egyptian god that represented life resurrection the whole nine yards but when they were in memphis seeing this placard it was basically hepka pata and so it literally means the place where pata manifests so it's a temple <laughs> it's like here worship pata right this is where he manifests or he she whatever it and so the greeks kind of got this wrong and so this became egyptos Mm. But the original name for Egypt was was Kem, the land of the black, uh, the black alluvian soil, the people that lived there. There was there was a lot of this, this that ended up in Kem, and so when when the Arabs showed up, uh, they realized Kem was the name for a lot of this, and so this is where we get the words for Al Kemi, right? Or Yes, sir. And Chemi uh, chemistry also comes from this. So, yeah. Kemet and Al Kemet, uh, 100%. That's why uh, in my Ooh, own email, I never put that together. <laughs> <laughs> I spelled my email address E L K H E M I T uh, or I S T, sorry, uh, L Kemis. L. Well, there, there's a whole different story with L, right? Yeah. Boy, is there ever two. Oh. Well, uh, one. Uh, Andreas, my body. I feel so bad that I'm so late for Hans Dietrich. This is like way too big of a show to miss. I'm sorry. Good to see you, Mr. Well, Dietrich. Thank you. You made it, sir. And yeah. You're here. Oh, right? bold. <laughs> <laughs> I love that shirt. That's a great shirt. Thank you. Yeah. I, yeah. Everything it's, I do is kind of. It's spiraling into the fold, it's, right? It's so good. Oh, yeah. It's I'm, good. Given, I'm giving peace to my, my Maui friends. I used to live on Maui. So it's. Yeah. Prayers it's to everybody still having to rebuild, still uh, to, well, of course, eternally prayers to all the lives lost in that tragedy that happened. And But it's all right. I heard Obama bought Magnum P.I.'s mansion and it's doing fine. So. All good. Don't worry. <laughs> all good. Yeah. I'm sorry. I got here late. So Me I, meanwhile, I, I, let's let's go back to the full. So yeah, into the linguistics <laughs> of uh, alchemy and Egypt. One of my theories of Egypt is like energy gypped. E the uh, Egyptian energy stolen and that it was stolen when they removed the Ark out of the uh, pyramid, out of the king's chamber there uh, when uh, Moses... We're jumping ahead, we're jumping ahead. Man. Oh, really, man? <laughs> I very much like this train of thought. But uh, just, you're, you're, you're spot on aspect. with that. No, you're spot on with that. So the, the Greeks call it ho, ho kep, kepta, which came from uh, hepkapata, and then it became Egyptos, and now we know it as Egypt. But the ancient name for this land was Kem. The land or, Kem or so why not Kemet? So that's well, a Kem, Kemet, there. same thing. Correct. So the, is the T silent though, or because it's interesting? I've there, noticed there's that. no vowels. It's all Kem. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so this is interesting because you've got like the word for the, which you know you don't usually have to keep by the end of the yeah. Middle Ages, but Al Kemi, you know, and Al Hebra, you know. This so is got... all. This is all the the Arabs afterward. Yeah. Yeah, they're, but, but they're they, studying they the Kemi original. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so some of the early languages in in Kemet were were Suf, yeah, you know, the Suf language, 